The universe is huge. We know this, but how huge? And how can we possibly measure the size of the universe? Put it like this. It's common to quote astronomical distances in light years. That's the distance light travels in a year, or about nine trillion kilometers. Given that, here are some facts to blow your mind. The diameter of the solar system is about eight light hours, or nine billion kilometers. The Milky Way, our galaxy, that's about 100,000 light years across, or close to one quintillion kilometers. And the next closest major galaxy, Andromeda, that's two and a half million light years away, which is just silly to talk about in kilometers. All pretty big distances, right? Now, let's talk about the whole universe. We can't see all of it. Some things are so far away, the light from there hasn't reached us yet. So we're gonna focus on the observable universe. That's the part that we, in principle, can see with light or gravitational waves. So how big is that? Well, it's a sphere with a radius of about 46 billion light years, or rounding down to keep it simple, about 90 billion light years end to end. Now that's crazy big, but it's even crazier that astronomers think they know that number. It's not like they measured the universe with a ruler, so how do they know? In a nutshell, you start with the age of the universe. The current estimate is about 13.8 billion years. That's the maximum amount of time light has had to travel to us. And then you work out how far away the emission point of that light is right now. And that's the radius of the observable universe. Remember, that distance is not 13.8 billion light years. It's much bigger. To understand why, it's critical to realize that space itself is expanding. A popular analogy that I wish I could take credit for is a loaf of raisin bread rising in the oven. Each raisin represents a cluster of galaxies in the dough space. Now, the raisins don't move through the dough, but as the bread bakes and rises, all the raisins get further apart from each other because the dough itself expands. Now, each raisin stays the same size. Galaxy clusters aren't expanding, and neither are individual galaxies or the Earth or people or trees. It's just the relatively empty space between those large clusters of galaxies. And not only does the dough expand, it can expand at different rates during different stages of the baking process. Maybe really fast for a billion years, then slower for the next two billion. These two facts, the expansion of space and the fact that it can expand at a variable rate, complicate how we measure the size of the observable universe. In fact, space itself can expand at any rate it wants to, even faster than the speed of light. So over the lifetime of the universe, the birthplace of a beam of light can be carried ridiculously far away by the expanding space dough. To know exactly how far, though, and calculate the size of the universe, you need to know how quickly space has been expanding at every moment in history, ever. So how can we possibly know the expansion history of the universe? Using something called cosmological redshift, which is like a fingerprint that the expansion of space leaves on beams of light. Let me take a moment to explain. Light has a color determined by its wavelength. Longer wavelength light is redder, shorter bluer. If space were not expanding, then light from a distant galaxy would be the same color when it arrived on Earth as it was when it first set out. Blue on departure, blue on arrival. But because space is expanding, the wavelength of light gets stretched as it travels to us, making the blue light red, hence the term red shift. In more extreme cases, the wavelength can be stretched out of the visible spectrum altogether into microwaves or radio waves. Now, here comes another important point, so pay attention. The light from more distant galaxies is red shifted more than light from nearby ones. You see, the light from more distant places has further to go, so it spends more time in the expanding space, in the rising dough, and thus it has its wavelength stretched more. Makes sense, but how are redshift and distance related quantitatively? That is the million dollar question. If we knew the answer in numerical detail, we could figure out the expansion history, and in turn, the size of the universe. So can you do this? Can you measure the distance redshift relationship? No sweat, just find a bunch of faraway galaxies, much further than Andromeda, measure their distances and their redshifts, then put those distances and redshifts on a graph and find the best fit curve. Voila, you now know the distance redshift relationship, and from that, how fast the universe was expanding at every moment ever. Once you have the expansion history, how do you actually determine the size of the universe? Remember, as I said a long, long time ago, we first need to get the universe's age. So let's go back to the raisin bread. If we run the movie of the rising dough backwards at the rate given to us by the expansion history, eventually nearby raisins will sit on top of each other. That is the Big Bang, and how long it takes to get back to this point is the current age of the universe. Our best current estimate using that expansion history is 13.8 billion years, give or take. Step two is, well, annoying math but we can represent it visually as follows. Imagine that seconds after the Big Bang happens, every raisin emits a beam of light that can then travel without hitting any obstacles. As we run the movie forward, 
At the rate given to us by the expansion history, those imaginary beams would travel through the expanding space and reach us at different times. One of those beams of rays and light would be just reaching us as the clock hits 13.8 billion years. We then see where that raisin is now. Answer, about 46 billion light years away. Boom. So that's how we know that the observable universe is about 90 billion light years in diameter. But what about the unobservable universe? Aren't there galaxies even further away whose light hasn't reached us yet? Well, yeah, there are but I'm afraid that's a subject for another episode. If you're inclined, go ahead and get the discussion about that started in the comments below. I'll report on any interesting threads from that conversation on the next episode of Space Time. Last week, we asked whether it's irrational to believe in aliens. Here's what you guys had to say. Pantsu Man and others point out that it'd be really low odds to accidentally bump into a Millennium Falcon in space. I think you guys took my glib example a little too literally. The real point of the Fermi Paradox is that colonization on a galactic scale could happen so quickly that if life is really that common, at least one civilization should have already done it by now. And they should be so widespread that we'd see some evidence. Nick G commented that a really advanced civilization might not try to expand outward into space, but inward into, let's say, advanced computer circuitry. Pretty good thought. The G to AFH asks, what about the Prime Directive? Well, what about James T. Kirk? He didn't care about the Prime Directive much, so why should all the aliens? And Rob LaRosa left us with a deeply insightful comment from Calvin and Hobbes. Good work. Yeah.